When our Lord was on the cross, He uttered what we call seven sayings. That is seven words on the cross. And I want to think with you this evening, this Good Friday, on one of them. And it's recorded in John chapter 19. I'm going to read from verse 16. John 19, verse 16, so he, that is Pilate, who was the Roman uh, procurator, the Roman governor, uh, the judge, so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is in Aramaic called Golgotha. We normally refer to it as Calvary. Uh, which comes from the Latin, but the Aramaic, Golgotha, the same place, the place of the crucifixion, the place of the skull, Golgotha. Verse 18, there they crucified Him, and with Him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Can you picture that? Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, notice that, all was now finished, said, to fulfill the Scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to His mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, it is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up His spirit. From the cross of Christ, then, there is the cry a cry of triumph, a cry of victory, a cry which echoes throughout the world tonight, and a cry when when it was first stated, resounded through the very courts of heaven and earth, finished. One word in Greek, tetelestai, Jesus did not say, I am finished, as perhaps men who were crucified might have done. He's not saying, I am finished, but He's saying it, third person, it is finished. But what was finished? What did He mean by that incredible cry from the cross that we hear again this evening, this Good Friday, finished? Well, come with me and survey the cross of Christ. First, we can say that the sufferings of Jesus are over. Uh, So when Jesus shouts from the cross, finished, He's referring to His sufferings. The physical sufferings of Jesus are now over. They are now completed. They are now finished. Think of the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. As our Lord, the New Testament writers tell us, sweated. His sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Reflect on the injustice of the trials, the Jewish and the Roman trials. Think of the mockery, the beatings, the scourging the spitting, the utter blasphemy as they crucified the Lord of glory. I read from Isaiah 53, Isaiah 50, verse 6, Isaiah prophesies of the Messiah, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Under Jewish law, a victim could not be beaten more than 40 times. Forty was the maximum number of stripes, of whipping, of scourging on the back of a victim. So rather than break the law, the victim was whipped not more than 39 times, and that figure is referred sometimes in the Bible. Now, the scourging of Jesus was not done by uh, the Jews, it was done by the Romans. And Jesus was stripped of His clothing, bent forward over a low, thick stump. And the whip, the scourge, a piece of wood on which there were long strips of leather with pieces of metal or bone at the very tip of the whip, and there he was scourged. The scourge was designed, deliberately designed, to inflict maximum punishment, maximum pain, maximum drawing of blood. The whip would cut deep into the flesh and tear the flesh. And this is our Savior. This is the one who comes to save us, stripe by stripe, scourging by scourging, beating by beating. Jesus, the Christ, is bearing the punishment for your sins and mine. And then they take Him, as we read, bearing His own cross, 
Outside to the skull, Golgotha, and there the riders say they crucify him. His holy hands, which had healed the helpless in their pain, his holy hands, which had taken the children in his arms and blessed them, his holy hands, which had reached out and touched the unclean leper, the holy hands, which had broken the bread and fed multitudes, these holy hands, which had reached out and touched the eyes of the blind, these hands are now taken and with cruel spears and nails. He's pierced to the cross. His holy feet, these feet which had always trod in his Father's path, these feet which every single step that our Lord took was in accordance with his Father's will, those holy feet are now taken and are cruelly pierced to that old rugged cross. And one of the Roman soldiers, not really realizing what he was doing, takes his spear and pierces the side of our beloved Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that they didn't know that they were crucifying the Lord of glory. Crucifixion, the form of killing designed by the Romans to inflict maximum pain, maximum humiliation as the individual is strung up for everyone to say and to ridicule, and there hangs our Savior, nailed to an old rugged cross. But now we hear the cry, finish, all of the physical sufferings are over. Never again shall wicked men beat our Savior. Never again shall they spit on His face. Never again shall the Lord of glory be nailed to a cross. Do you hear His cry? Finished, the physical sufferings of our Lord are over but there's more. The spiritual suffering of Jesus are over. Unbelievably horrific, horrific, though the physical sufferings are, they pale into significance, don't they, compared with the spiritual sufferings by the Son of God, the Holy One, in the hours of darkness on the cross. Pastor Cashwell began this evening by reminding us of Paul's magnificent words in 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul says, he who knew no sin. There is not one person here who could say that because all of us have sinned. All of us are repelled by some kinds of sin, but we tolerate sin in our own lives. But this one is sinless, perfect. He did no sin. He knew no sin. In him was no sin. And this one who is without sin become sin for us. All of the ugliness, all of the horrible, all of the vileness, all of the violence and the immorality and the treachery and the deceit and lies, yes, from you and from me are heaped on the sinless one. The Holy One takes our unholiness John the Baptist said of him, look at the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How does he take away the sin of the world? He takes away the sin of the world on the cross. So Peter himself says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Do you see him taking away your sin? The just one is crushed by the wickedness of the unjust. The judgment of a holy God that should have fallen on us because of our sin, our deliberate rebellion and transgression against the holy God, now falls on the sinless, perfect Christ. We read, yet Isaiah prophesied, we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God. Oh yes, He scourged by the Romans. He's crucified by the Romans. He is delivered up to Pilate by the Jews, but most of all, he is there smitten by God, the spiritual sufferings of Jesus. But now, as we hear his cry finished, the spiritual sufferings of the sin bearer on the tree are now over. Finish the sufferings of Jesus are over. But secondly, all of the Old Testament prophecies and types and shadows 
regarding the death of the Messiah are fulfilled. You don't need to be an Old Testament scholar uh, to know that so much of the Old Testament is pointing forward uh, to the Redeemer, to the coming of the Messiah. I read some of that from Isaiah 53. You see, the prophecies were that not only would the Messiah die, not only that would He die a violent death, but He would die on a cross, the death of crucifixion. David writing in Psalm 22, a thousand years before the event, says this, Psalm 22, verse 16, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I count all of my bones, they stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lot. Yes, Isaiah was right. He's despised and rejected by men. Amazingly, he comes to his own, and his own receive him not. His very nation, the Jewish nation, largely reject him, despise him, don't esteem him. And he's called then the Lord of glory. The God of joy is described in his humanity leading up to his death on the cross. He's described as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And all of these types and shadows and prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah, and all of the Levitical sacrifices, all of the, the lambs and the, and the goats and the birds that are offered up to the Lord are types and shadows of the coming of the Messiah, so that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed today is the Jewish Passover. We have a neighbor who's Jewish, and he told uh, Goodney earlier in the week that he's having friends over, and they're celebrating Passover right this tonight. You say, what was Passover? Do you remember just before uh, the Israelites were delivered from the slavery of Egypt, uh, they were told on that night, that memorable night, to take a lamb, the very best of the flock, and to kill it and they to take his blood and to put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. And when the avenging angel call, came and saw the blood, they would pass over. But if the blood was not applied, the eldest son would be killed. And so that lamb was a picture of the Messiah, a picture of the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And so that we who trust in Christ, we are covered by His blood, and so the condemnation and the judgment of God that we deserve because of our sin is now passed over because we're sheltered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not one prophecy, not one allusion to the death of the Messiah predicted in the Old Testament is left unfulfilled. So Peter, talking to people who knew their Bibles, says in Acts 3, verse 18, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that His Christ, that's His Messiah, should suffer, He thus fulfilled. And so Peter could stand among the Pharisees and the religious rulers and people who knew the Old Testament, who had memorized large part of it, he could say without any contradiction that all of the prophecies regarding the Messiah have been fulfilled as foretold by the prophets. Finished. The sufferings of Jesus are over. All of the Old Testament prophecies and types regarding the death of the Messiah are over. Thirdly, our salvation is perfectly accomplished. Do you realize that the eternal decree of God the Father included the cross of Christ? That the cross of Christ, the death of Jesus, God's precious Son, the Messiah, was in God's eternal decree. There's an old hymn that we sometimes sing, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Yes, this is the plan of God. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary, that this is God's plan. Yes, man is held responsible for putting the Messiah on the tree. We are responsible because He bears our sin, but behind it all, we understand that Jesus is not a victim 
ensnared in difficult circumstances. He's not a victim. He's a victor. And the Father sends His Son to die on the cross. So Peter, on the great day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he says to the Jewish nation, Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So this is God's plan, that Jesus is not a victim uh, ensnared in difficult circumstances from which it's impossible for him to extricate himself. No, this is what God wanted. This was God's way of salvation, the only way of salvation for sinners like you and me to be saved. And so God in great love, the Father in great love, sends His Son who comes in love and always does the Father's will. So Jesus says in John 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. Accomplish His work? What's His work? Primarily His redemptive work. His name is Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. The Father sends the Son to do His plan of salvation. John 6, verse 30, Jesus says, I've come down from heaven. Think of that. Jesus is no ordinary man, no ordinary prophet, not just a miracle worker. He comes down from heaven. God incarnate, He says, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And what is the will of Him who sent me? It is to die as a sacrifice for sinners. And so during the life of our Lord on earth, He always pleased His Father. He did the Father's will perfectly. And in, in anticipation of His death on the cross, Jesus prays to His Father, John 17, verse 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you've given me to do. He anticipates His death on the cross. You've given me this task. This is your will that I come as a Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And so, on the cross when He says, finished, what's He meaning? He perfectly finished the work, the redemptive work which the Father had given Him to do. Do you, do you understand that? The will of the Father was that His Son should come from heaven to earth and die on the cross for sinners like you and like me. In the horror of Gethsemane, that garden of gloom, faced with the horror of the cross, faced with drinking that awful cup which the Father had for him, Jesus says in Mark 14, verse 36, to his Father, remove this cup from me. But then he said, John 18, verse 11, shall I not drink the cup that my Father has given me? What's the cup? The cup is that he goes to the cross and endures the punishment, the wrath, and the judgment of God that you and I deserve. And in obedience to His Father's will, I want you to understand this, in obedience to His Father's will, He goes to the cross. No, the cross was not a surprise to Jesus. He knew the reason why the Father had sent the Son. He knew His name was Jesus, Savior. He Himself said, remember on that amazing dialogue he had with Nicodemus in Roman in John chapter 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What was he saying? Just as Moses made a, a snake and put it on a pole in the wilderness, so Jesus is saying, in the same way I'm going to be lifted up, that whoever looks to me will be saved. He said to His disciples on another occasion, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill Him. So during His lifetime, Jesus Himself is predicting His death on the cross, that He's going to be delivered to wicked people, and they're going to kill Him, and they're going to crucify Him. And He's saying this in the wonderful chapter of the Good Shepherd in John chapter 10. Jesus says, I'm the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives His life for the sheep. What does He mean? Where would He give His life? On the cross. I'm the Good Shepherd who gives my life for the sheep. Don't think of Him as a victim. 
He himself says in John 10, no one takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received from my Father. He is the Lord of glory. Yes, men put him on the cross. But beyond that and behind that and greater than that, the Father's will is that he dies. And the Son, in perfect obedience to the Father's will, is voluntarily laying down his life and also predicting, as we'll celebrate on Sunday, that he will be raised from the dead, that he himself will take up his life. Finished. What was finished? Jesus perfectly accomplishes the Father's will to die on the cross as the Savior of the world. You and I leave many unfinished things in our lives. We start projects and don't complete them. We go to college and begin a course and, and never graduate. We have unfulfilled dreams. We leave a trail of unfinished business behind us. But at the end of his life, Jesus on the cross gives that mighty word, a word of triumph, a word of victory, a word that reverberates around the world. Finished. Everything. Can I say everything that he had set out to do in accordance with his Father's will is fully, perfectly, and completely finished. Do you hear his cry tonight? Finished. Finished. Not a cry of helplessness, not a cry of defeat, not a cry of tragedy, but a cry of triumph. The greatest cry of triumph that the world had ever heard. Jesus perfectly finishes all that he had come to do. And this is why we have to say, as the Scripture makes it very clear, that this then is the only way by which sinners can be saved. That cry finished. For the grammarians here, it is in the perfect tense, which means it has been and is and will forever remain finished. It was finished then, and it never, ever has to be repeated. That is a once and for all sacrifice as our Savior on that Good Friday voluntarily lays down his life. Therefore, you can't add to it. Therefore, you can't improve it. Therefore, it is audacious. It is the height of human folly to think that you can get to heaven some other way. This is the perfect way. We sang, it was my sin that held him there. Do you believe that? Your sin? Not just sin generally. Can you say it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished? His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I know that it is finished. You see, the cross of Christ is a priceless and perfect masterpiece. There is nothing that you can add to it. There's nothing that you can do. The Father's cup is now empty. The blood is now shed. The gulf is now bridged. The veil is now torn. The way of access to God is now opened. The way to heaven is prepared. The debt is fully paid now. Finished. Nothing for you to do. No wonder we sing, hallelujah, what? What a Savior. What a Savior. You really think you can improve on the finished work of Christ? Religion wants to do something, wants to add their little bit, keep their self-respect, think, well, I can get to heaven my own way. Yes, if you want to believe in Jesus, go ahead, but I can go my way. How foolish. Basic mis misunderstanding of God's way of salvation. Authentic Christianity is not for you to do something. It is to say, look at Christ. Believe in Christ, embrace Christ, who has done everything for you. Everything is prepared. Now confess your sin. Cry out to Christ to come and to save you and hear his word. Finished. Nothing to be done. How wonderful. That's why we believe so much in grace. Perhaps as the 
orchestra began with amazing grace. You thought, I, I don't know if that's appropriate on Good Friday. It is, let me tell you, it's always appropriate that we are saved entirely by grace because grace means that we cannot save ourselves and must look to Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Finished. Let me ask you, do you know this Savior? Have you had the experience of coming to the cross and kneeling there and seeing the wonder of the Father's love for you, the wonder of the Son's love for you, the beauty of that perfect sacrifice on the cross that He paid the price for your sins, that the debt is now paid, and you cried out to Christ and say, I believe, come and save me. Come and forgive me. Come and cleanse me. And that is all of your grace. Did you notice as I read that when Jesus said, it is finished, John then says, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I like that. It wasn't that Jesus shouted, finished, and then his head flopped down. No, he bowed his head, a deliberate act to his Father's will. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You say, why do you say that? Here is our Lord in all of the suffering and all of the excruciating pain physically and spiritually in these hours of darkness. What a wonderful example to us in life's difficulties. Some of you, as you sit here on this Good Friday, have had a difficult year. You've experienced loss, perhaps bereavement, disappointment, confusion, and you're a follower of Christ. And you say life is hard. It is. I understand. Can I ask you to look at Christ, to hear His cry finish, and you say, John, I rejoice in that. I, I am saved. But do you see Him now bowing His head and dismissing His spirit? Be still, proud heart. How can I stand and gaze upon that head so humbly bending low? and not lament with tears and shame of face thy willful ways, rebelling, murmuring so. Oh, for the grace in every earthly loss to bow the head to God as Christ did on the cross. Will you do that? Brother, sister, you've experienced some loss, some pain, some disappointment. You've been crushed with something. Will you tonight, as you look at the Savior, bow your head and say, not my will, but yours be done. And listen again to that amazing cry, finished. That cry echoes throughout the whole universe, bringing a message of salvation, a message of triumph, a message of hope to all who humbly kneel at the cross of Christ. So we prepare our hearts to break bread. Will you Come with me and join me, as it were, at the foot of the cross, and humbly bow with me in prayer. Will you do that? Eternal God and our Father, we stand amazed at the foot of the cross this Good Friday. Some here, I think, have never yet cried to Christ for salvation. They've looked to themselves, they've looked to the church, they've looked to their goodness, they've looked to turning over a new leaf and to modifying their conduct rather than looking to Christ and Christ alone. May they look on Him, to look on Christ and be saved. There are others here, Father, who are true followers of Christ, and it's a difficult time for them. And so I pray that they humbly will bow their head to You as Christ did on the cross and pray, not my will, but Thine be done. For such a magnificent Savior, Father, for such a plan of salvation, which to the world is foolishness, but to us who believe it is the power of God and the wisdom of God, strengthen us, Father. And we thank You for our precious Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.